Okay, it's 8 o'clock, so we uh, will begin. The opening song tonight is Psalm 99. Psalm 99 stands as 1, 2, and 3, page 241 in the Book of Praise. Scripture reading tonight is taken from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, page 726 in the Pew Bibles. Isaiah 6, we'll read the whole chapter. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed." Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. But the Lord removes people from far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. 
stop there. Shall we pray together? Ask the Lord for his blessing. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we come to you at the beginning of this evening to thank you that we could be together here again, once again to be taught, taught about your glory, about your holiness, your majesty. Lord, we thank you that we can know you as our Lord and as our Father, but also that we know that you are a, a holy God. We pray that you would strengthen us this evening with the message that we receive. Be with Reverend Bauman too, grant unto him what he stands in need of so that this speech may be used by us who are here and also those who watch it on other occasions as well and also those who are live streaming tonight. We pray that you would keep sin and far from us and fill us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name alone we pray. Amen. I'd like to give a warm and hearty welcome to each one of you here. Also those who are following along on the live stream, welcome to you as well. We just have a few announcements and then we'll go directly into the... Uh, Reverend Bauman's talk. Um, the following speech, the next one following this one, will be in three weeks' time on December the 14th. That'll be the last one before Christmas, and then in uh, January we'll be picking up on that. So keep an eye on your church bulletins, and uh, we'll, we'll have the notices out. Once again, the question and answer uh, session will... Uh, if possible, that you can send your questions in by text message. The telephone number is on the screen there, 289-440-1489. So we encourage folks who are live streaming also to uh, send in the questions too. Um, there are, again, a few books on the back table there, mostly by Reverend Bauman and, and a couple other ones. Feel free to browse there and also to shop if you feel so inclined. And let me see, there are coffees on. So if you like coffee afterwards, feel free to uh, take time and stick around and have some fellowship. And we welcome Reverend Bowen back into our midst tonight. And uh, the floor is yours, brother. Carl and... Good evening, all. Let's start with wetting the whistle, eh? So the topic that I thought I would zero in on tonight um, is, again, one that's not mentioned in um, Article 1 of the Belgic Confession, and that is, God is holy. Article 1, oh my, anyway, there it is, um, mentions a number of the attributes of our Lord, but not holy, it isn't there, which again raises the question, um, then why deal with that? There's a couple of reasons, and the, um, the one is that our culture has humanized God, or maybe I should say creatureized God. And it would seem to me that a term like holy is going to capture the antidote to this concept of humanizing or creatureizing the Lord. It's also striking that as Guido de Brer writes his confession, he uses the word holy numerous times. I didn't do a count, but the term appears as an adjective modifying nouns like scripture, books, um, sacraments, church, assembly, trinity, and so many other words that appear and we would expect to appear in the Belgic Confession. And the Bible attaches the word holy to that. 
but he doesn't mention in relation to God. But then the question arises, then why would he attach that adjective holy to so many of the nouns that he needs to place in his confession? And clearly we understand why there is something divine of God in the word scripture, in the word Bible, in the word trinity, in the word assembly, in the word sacraments, and so on. All of these biblical concepts, of course, come from God. And so, even though Debrett doesn't mention the word holy in relation to God himself, he certainly understands that God is holy. And the Bible, of course, makes that point many, many times. And then specifically in a passage as Isaiah 6. What we will notice, though, um, even as the Bible uses the word holy in relation to so many, again, nouns, priests, tabernacle, Levites, and the list goes on and on and on, um, just as the Belgian Confession does, the intriguing thing and the important thing that we need to notice up front is that the idea of holiness does not travel from people to God, from earth to heaven, but the idea travels the other way, from heaven to earth, from God to people. And that's something that I want to work out and expand upon um, this evening. So, first of all, the term then, what does the term holy or holiness mean? We're hearing that word as North Americans of the 21st century. To us, to our North American ears, the word holy or holiness has in it something of, of prudishness strictness, law-keeping, moral purity. Somehow the idea that God doesn't want us to have fun. That idea? I need to stress that that is simply not the biblical loading of the word. That's a caricature. The biblical loading of the word holy, and for your information, you've all heard it before, I suspect, the Hebrew word is kadosh. Linguists agree that the word kadosh comes from a root that means to cut. And of course, when you cut, you end up separating. And that's the idea that comes with kadosh, to be separate, to be different. Applied to God, the word kadosh, holy, catches the notion that God is different. From what? And the answer is from everything. He's in a class all by himself. That in turn generates an intriguing observation. And that is, people God's commanded us to have dominion over, and that's to say that we're also to explore and to study and to come to understand 
And we do that invariably by means of comparisons, analogies. Little things like something is big. Well, in relation to what? In comparison with me or something else I'm comparing it to. Something is there. Well, where's that? Well, that's somewhere comparative to where here, where I am, right? It's there, not here. It's, we, we, we always work in terms of comparisons or analogies. It's, it's, how we, it's how we study. It's how we come to understand. And you can, that, that, that holds true in relation to very, very small things that we use, microscopes and very, very big things that we use, uh, space telescopes, uh, think of the Hubble. Um, but we're always busy with looking at things as people from where we're at. Now, how do you do that in relation to God? And that's where the word holy comes into the picture. God is in a class by himself, separate from us, anything we can see or touch. But that also means that God is un reachable by us, unsearchable by us, incomprehensible by us. He's in a class by himself, and that's not surprising, in as much as he's the creator and everything else is created. Obviously, the Creator is bigger, is more, is superior to the created. Created is here. Creator is there, is, is, is above. And in no place in our world do we expect or do we make to understand how we, creators, makers, made what we made. That gets to the notion of God is holy. He's different. He's distinct. He's separate from us, our world, what we can research. He's other. Though the word holy is not in Article 1, some of the implications of what I've said certainly are. He's eternal. He's incomprehensible. He's infinite. Words like that all have their root in the idea that God is holy, separate, distinct, other. But now here's the marvel. Though we creatures cannot research him because he's in a class by himself, other, holy, it's pleased him to develop a relation with creatures and in the process to reveal himself. Develop a relation 
And yet, as he develops a relation with creatures, he's losing nothing of his creator status. He's not sharing any of his creator status with us creatures, as if in some way become co-creators or co-creatures. He remains him, creator, we creatures, hence distinct, kadosh, separate. Yet, relationship. And that's an amazing thing. That He, sovereign creator, draw people, creatures, into that relationship without losing any of His identity. This gets also to why the Lord gave the second commandment. The first commandment, of course, that He gave to His people was, you shall have no other gods before Me, and we spoke about that in previous weeks. But the second one, you shall not make for yourself a curved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath the waters under the earth. And the whole point is, exactly because God is holy, creator, separate, you are not able to capture Him in creaturely terms. So don't try. Would making a calf, a young bull, as Ezra did at Mount Sinai, would that capture what God is like? And clearly the answer is no. And trying to do that provokes his jealousy. Why? Because it's an invasion of his holiness. It's an effort to creaturize God. Dagon of the Philistines had the shape of a fish. Would God be okay with His people making an image of a fish in relation to Himself? And the answer, of course, is no. How about a person? Again, the answer is no. Not even the highest of God's creatures to capture what God is like. And the Lord says, you can't do that. It just doesn't work. Um, here's one slide I missed in relation to uh, what is holy, but there you have it. Um, you cannot capture God in any creaturely fashion. That's why when the Lord told Israel to build the tabernacle, He said, you build in the back the most holy place, and in the most holy place you place the ark. It's fine. The ark represents God's throne. Yes, He's king. But what's seated on the throne? Nothing. Nothing. And once the ark disappeared, which it did, the most holy place is empty. In big distinction from the temples of other religions. I mean, Dagon stood in the temple there in, uh, in Gath or Ekron, wherever it was. But in God's temple, empty, because you cannot 
capture using any creature the identity of this God. He's other. He's holy. And those are concepts that have come back time and again in, um, in Scripture, even without using the actual, the actual words. Um, the discussion that Job has with his friends, what Job's friends attempted to do was apply human logic to God. They did not make a molten image of God. God's like a fish, God's like a calf, nothing of that. But they didn't make a mental image of God. And in their argument, in the discussion with Job, they're trying to convince Job that God is as logical, as rational in his thinking, as people. There's a mental image of God, a humanization of God in the argument of the friends. Job, all this bad stuff has happened, and the reason why it's happened is because you've sinned. Very logical. A humanization of God. Elihu, of course, resisted that. And he says, no, God's not like that. If you take Job 33, where Elihu responds to the discussion of, uh, of the friends, he says, Behold, in this you are not right. I will answer you, God is greater than man. Well, there you have it. Don't humanize God. He's greater. He's other. Kadosh. And in chapter 34, verse 13, who gave God charge over the earth? Who laid on him the whole world? If each set his heart to it and gathered to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together, man would return to dust. And what's he saying there? That's the idea that God's so other. Okay, and, 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 and Elihu comes back to that theme more often, and of course, when the Lord himself talks to Job, that he makes very clear to that. He's in a category of his own. The word holy isn't used, but the concept is right there in the last pages of the book of Job. But to, get us, to help us get a good handle on this, I, I, I'd, I'd like us to, to turn to the prophecy of Isaiah. And Carl read for us chapter 6, but I'd like to start with chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 4, the prophet Isaiah is, is speaking to the, the people of Israel, God's people, that's this people that God particularly relates to. And he says in verse 4, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly, they've forsaken the Lord, they've despised the Holy One of Israel, they're utterly estranged. Striking words because when you look a bit farther, had they forgotten, forsaken, despised the Holy One of Israel? Well, it depends what you mean. Look at verse 11. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices as the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I don't delight in the blood of bulls and of lambs or of he ghosts. When you come to appear before me, who's required you this trembling of my courts? Had they forgotten God? And they themselves would say, not a chance. Trampling of my courts suggests that these people were diligent in going to the temple, 
we'd say going to church. And they came with all kinds of sacrifices. Verse 11, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices? I mean, the free will offerings were overflowing. Church treasury, more than full. And yet the Lord says, you've forsaken the Holy One of Israel. What had they done? Humanized God. Forgotten His holiness, His otherness. Brought God down to human level. Like what? So here's where we go to chapter 6. I did put it on the screen because I want to spend a little bit of time there. In the year that King Uzziah died, and if you know your Bible history, then you will know that Uzziah was one of the few very godly kings in Judah. He reigned 52 years. He did many, many good things. Second Chronicles 28 will tell you all about it. But somewhere along the line toward the end of his kingship, he lost sight of the otherness of God. And what he did is develop a mental image of God, a perception of God that allowed him to do what God had forbidden. And that was, of course, the Lord had told Israel that only the priests may enter the temple. Uzziah thought, but I can do it too. I love God. I serve God. What could be wrong with me bringing a sacrifice? And if you bring God down to a human level, where toing and froing in a relationship works, well, yeah, that all makes sense. That he would say, look, I am king in Israel, and I'm a very godly king, and he was. Let me make a sacrifice to God myself. God's reaction was to strike him with leprosy. But I mention this as one example of chapter 1, verse 4. My people have forsaken the Lord, despised the Holy One of Israel. And they fix the thought in their mind, we can serve God as we think is okay. Second commandment issue. We're to serve God, Lord's 35, only as God has commanded in His Word. And that's the context the man died. In that same year, the Lord showed Isaiah and so Israel who He is. What was actually wrong with Isaiah's thinking? He'd forgotten the otherness of God, the holiness of God. So, the Lord showed the prophet himself sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And we hear that 
sitting upon a throne, and okay, yep, thrones, we know what they are. Um, that's where kings sit. The Lord's clearly the king. I mean, Isaiah died, but we have a king. The Lord's the king. Yeah. But I want to draw your attention to the words high and lifted up. What does that mean to you? Sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And I didn't organize this with Carl, but Carl put a nice chair there for us. So we got a prop, and it's high and lifted up, yes? Is that what we're to think of? Simply an elevated high chair, and that's where God's sitting. And the answer is no. The particular chair that God's on is so let me put it this way. Our normal chairs, except for this one right here, about a foot and a half off the ground, and the legs about a foot and a half apart, because that's the size of people. The Lord, sitting on a chair high and lifted up, in the eye of your mind, See the one leg of this chair on this hill, the other leg of the chair on the other side of another hill. Get the picture? High and lifted up. This is a huge chair. Why? Because God's so other, different. And the train of his robe filled the temple. We've all seen brides coming down the aisle. More often than not, with someone of a train on the wedding dress. And that train may be two feet, maybe five feet. And from time to time, you see one of ten. This train filled the temple. Can you see that? A train covering all the pews, filling the aisles and the fronts and the organ and the piano and the lot. This is different. This is other, holy. Now, while I'm going through this, I want to suggest that you have a question spinning in the back of your head. And the question I'd like you to think about is this. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. What did God look like? Why does the prophet describe the chair, not the Lord? The train, not the Lord. Then we read, verse 2, above him stood the seraphim. Seraphim is plural. I am is the Hebrew way to make something plural. But the word seraph is actually the Hebrew word for burning. Presumably, these are angels. This is the only time in the Bible where we read about seraphim. Why are they called burning ones? And you'll recall when Moses was at the burning bush, Why was it burning? What was the significance of its burning?
burning. The point is, God was there. So other, so distinct, so different that the bush in his proximity burst into flame. The Lord God appeared to Israel on Mount Sinai, appeared as, well, the whole journey out of Egypt, a column of fire by night and cloud by day. But God comes on the mountain, and there's fire on the mountain and smoke in the proximity of God bursts into flame. So other angels burning. The presence of God burst into flame. What's it say of God? So other, different, Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. Why? And these are heavenly creatures. They're not touched by sin, but they can't look at God. Why? So other. They cover their feet. Why? Because they're creatures, because they're finite. How can creatures survive in the presence of the Creator? He's so other. He's so devouring. consuming fire. And with two, they flew. What are angels? Psalm 103, they're ministering spirits, or as Hebrews 1 writes it, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to serve those who are to obtain salvation, sent forth to serve? God sends them to serve? Well, here they are, flying, doing what they're told. By who? Him who is so other, separate, holy. And that's what they say. One to the other. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Other, other, other. They keep saying to each other, unique, 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 separate, separate, separate. He's distinct, he's distinct, he's distinct. They keep repeating it one through the other. And we get a sense of the, of the awe that comes from the seraphim in the presence of this God who is so distinct. And then the passage says, the whole earth is full of his glory. Where's God? In this vision, Presumably heaven on his throne. But the earth full. His train filled the temple. Well, the temple is only that big compared to the earth. His glory filled it. But now, what's his glory? What's that term mean? 
glory. The actual Hebrew word translated as glory captures the notion of of impressiveness, of weightiness, gravitas. And what these angels are saying, his impressiveness is obvious in every corner of the globe, fills it. That glory, what is it? That's the overflow of his holiness. That's the the expression of his otherness. What makes him distinct? And not a corner of the earth where you can't see it. His otherness. His too muchness. It's everywhere. And the seraphim themselves cover their faces. Then what should the Israelites do, right? And we keep reading. Oh, my. While they're calling back and forth, the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And of course, that's the seraph, one calling to the other. If God's servants in their call generate that kind of response, foundations shake. What's a foundation? Okay. We all know what a foundation is, but my point now is that's a created thing. It's part of God's handiwork. When the Creator distinct as he is. His servants say what he is, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Creation trembles. Creation responds. He's so other. And again, right? We find that theme time and again in the Scriptures. Take Psalm 29 with God's lightning, God's thunder, and Right? The Holy One. And creation responds. All. And then we read, the whole house is filled with smoke. The fire of God. The presence. The otherness. Yeah. Deuteronomy 4. Our God's a consuming fire. And it looks at. All right. And I said to you, please have this question spinning in the back of your head. Why doesn't the prophet describe God for us? What's the answer? Look. If the seraphim had to cover their face so they wouldn't see this God who is so other, distinct, too much, what would have happened to Isaiah's eyes if he had looked at God? You recall the Lord's word to Moses? Exodus 33, Moses wanted to see God. Show me your face, Moses said. And God's response was, no. Because no one can see God and live. (sighs) 
Had the prophet looked at God, he'd have perished. Creaturely eyes are made to see creaturely things. Creaturely eyes are not meant to see the Creator. He's too other. He's too much for human eyes, for creaturely eyes. On top of that, Let's not just theorize for a second that the prophet had seen God. Do you think human vocabulary would be able to find the words to describe what he saw? The prophet Ezekiel, chapter 1, sees a vision of God but again, he doesn't describe God, but what's around God. And the most common word in Ezekiel 1 is the word like, the word as. Because you can't find human words to adequately describe what's around God let alone God himself, to other, to much. For humanity to take in. Where does that leave us? Where it leaves us, the takeaway that it simply needs to be seared into our minds and hearts. That God is too other, is too distinct, is too different for any of us to develop an accurate mental picture of who he is, let alone an accurate molten image of who he is. In a class by himself, yet pleased to relate to us, so a posture of humility. what the seraphim did. We do metaphorically cover our face, cover our feet. We can't grasp this God. And that speaks to the words of Joshua. When Joshua, when the people of Israel, at Joshua's death said, oh, we'll serve the Lord, not a problem, we'll serve the Lord. And then Joshua responded and said, Joshua 24, you are not able to serve the Lord for he is a holy God. And if that was true of Israel, it's true of you and me. Add, of course, our sinfulness, our depravity. There is no way that you and I are able to relate 
to this God. We are too finite. He is too much for us. Yet, he relates to us. I'd like us here um, to, to, to take in the next section of the chapter here, verse 6, uh, verse 5, sorry. Isaiah sees God and what's around God, and he says, Woe is me. I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. I do this with people unclean lips. I've seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And there is that sense of humility. A sense of humility that must, that will characterize everyone who's gotten a tiny sense of God's identity. Woe is me. But then the beautiful gospel. Verse 6, one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal taken with tongs from the fire. He touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt's taken away, your sin atoned for. We understand that here is a foreshadowing of the work of Jesus Christ. I mean, that coal comes from the altar in the temple. That's the altar foreshadowing, the sacrifice of the Savior where the Lamb is sacrificed on a daily basis, right? So I want to get now to the work of Christ. But to do that, what I would love to do first is, is get you to take your Bibles and turn to chapter 53, Isaiah 53. And you can keep a finger if you want at Isaiah 6. We'll go back there momentarily. But 53... Verse 1, who has believed what he's heard from us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. We understand that those words describe the coming Christ. But set those words, please, Beside Isaiah 6, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up in his throne. His train filled the temple. Other, unique, distinct. Isaiah 53, no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty we should desire him. Here's a common man, very normal. How many people do you see on the street? They just look, they're not worth a second look. And you get no expectations from them. That's the fall into sin. Broken people. Now turn to John 12. John 12. 
John 12. Mm, ah. At verse 37, there's a new paragraph at 36b. I'll start there. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though we had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, and this is Isaiah 53, verse 1, he who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Therefore they could not believe. For again Isaiah said... He's blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. And that is a quote from Isaiah chapter 6. What's Jesus doing? He's laying chapter 6 beside chapter 53. Chapter 6, about that otherness, the too muchness of God. Chapter 53, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, became a normal man. You wouldn't give him a second look. Can you get your head into this? He who is other, he who is unique, he who is distinct, became profane. Where the word profane refers to created, non-holy, non-other. The Word became flesh. Now, isn't that a distinct concept? A unique concept. Creator becomes created, a creature. In the manger of Bethlehem, Holy One, the unique, the other, the separate one, became a baby. So normal. Like there's 12 and a dozen. And then John writes, chapter 12, verse 41, Isaiah said these things, quoting chapter 53 and quoting chapter 6, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory. Because he saw his glory. Glory. Whose glory? Oh, Jesus. Yeah. God, high and lifted up, become man, flesh, despised, not worth a second look. And he says, Isaiah saw his glory, saw his impressiveness, saw the outflow of his otherness. What happened there in Bethlehem was a revelation of God's holiness. His otherness, his uniqueness, 
And it was so impressive. And the same is true in relation to Jesus' crucifixion. Who died? The centurion said it. Surely this man was the Son of God. The God of Isaiah 6. On the cross. Talk about other. Talk about unique. But that's the glory. The impressiveness. The weightiness of the gospel. And then, what should we say of the Holy Spirit? After Jesus' resurrection and ascension, God came in the Spirit. The holy other one. So distinct, so unique. And makes his home in your heart and mine. 1 Corinthians 3, don't you know your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Of the Holy Spirit? Of the high and exalted one? You can't begin to grasp him. He's too much. And yet lives in people. Relates to people. It's also awesome. So to tie it all up, there's a couple of implications that clearly follow from this, and I've touched on them already somewhat, but North American Christian thinking thinks we can creaturize God, that we can pull him down to our level and it becomes searchable to us and we can say how he is and we can develop our theologies and understandings of God. He's our size. And you and I are touched by that. It's the, it's the air we breathe to and so, in our churches, sermons on the love of God, on the kindness of God, on the mercy of God are more palatable than sermons on the wrath of God, severity of God. holiness of God. The idea that he's so other, that he's unique, that we can't pull him down to sort of understand him, it doesn't sit right to my sinful nature. And it's a challenge. 
Honestly, it's a challenge to preach the holiness, the otherness, the greatness of God, and hence his jealousy, his wrath, his intolerance of sin. I say it's a challenge because the preacher is going to get pushed back. Because they're not polite things to say in our tolerant day. What's a preacher meant to do? Misrepresent God? We know the answer to that question, obviously. But then I'm going to put it to you. Insist that your preacher speaks up the uniqueness, the otherness, the holiness, the too muchness of God. That's the antidote that we're needing today in the context of bringing God down to our level and look, he's, he's buddy buddy with God and that, that, that sort of that sort of thinking. If God, other as He is, unique as He is, came to be one of us, flesh. Christmas, Calvary. Understand from that, please understand from that how much he hates sin and how much he loves us. Yes, that too. But you've got to catch both aspects. That's the inevitable consequence of understanding his holiness. Another thing, I did have it all on my screen, didn't I? Uh, okay. There. Resist mental images. God's friendly, God's my size, God's love, God's kind. Ah, that part's true, but there's far more to it, right? Resist making mental images. God will never fit in your mind or mine. But it connected with, in connection with that, this God does things in our lives. And we're quick to criticize what God does. That's not very nice of you, Lord, to do that. How can you take my loved one? How can you give cancer? How can you... He's not accountable to us. He's too other. He's too much for me. Let me be humble. And learn what he would teach. That's hard work. But it does begin with a healthy understanding of who God is. Adoration. We're in November. The month now it's Christmas. And we're going to focus on that manger. Yeah. Well, that's okay. But please, Adore the Word, God Most High, became flesh. Awesome. Adore. In that, of course, K 
characterizes the Christian life. Adoration of such a God, respect for Him, awe for Him, fear in that biblical loading of awe. But then there's also the words of the Apostle Peter. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus 11. Now, there's the word holy four times. Let me repeat that. You also be other. You also be distinct. You also be separate. In all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be other. You shall be separate. You shall be different. You shall be holy because I am holy, other, separate, different, distinct. That's written by the Apostle Peter. And in a couple of verses later, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Sojourners and exiles. <laughs> if you're other, if you're different, if you're separate, if you're unique in your society, people are going to look at you. Sojourners, exiles, your home isn't here. You don't fit. In Canada of 2022, oh, God's put us here, but He says, now you be holy, different like I am. And so, Canadians around you are going to say, they're funny people. They're different. And now the question is, if your God is so other, are you okay with being other? It's a great question. Or do you want to be the same? Those are your options. And your lifestyle hinges on who do you think God is. So, that's my story for tonight. There's the phone number. Feel free to use it. Two eight nine four four zero fourteen eighty nine. 489 Anyone who would like to... Uh Send an e a text message out. Does it mean anything that Isaiah 6 1 spells Lord instead of Lord? No, that's a good question, isn't it? There you go. Isaiah 6 1 um, spells the word Lord, I saw in the year the king as I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, and the Lord there is written in lowercase letters, and then in verse um, why is that so? Three 
3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And I just copy-pasted that out of a um, Bible program. And it's printed there, Lord of hosts in lowercase letters. But in my Bible, it's in uppercase letters. So there's a mistake there. So anyway, so the question becomes then, why the difference between the spelling of the word Lord in verse 1 and in verse 3? And that's all got to do with the, the fact that behind the word Lord in lowercase letters is the Hebrew word Adonai. The Hebrew word Adonai means master, Lord, sir. Whereas in uppercase letters, the word Lord, uppercase, translates the Hebrew word Yahweh. Yahweh being, of course, God's name as He's revealed Himself to the people He's relating to. So what we got here is, in the year that the king died, I saw the master, the master, the Lord, sitting on the throne. You catch the idea, right? Here's the, God is the king, master, hence Lord. That's the significance of the lowercase there. But when it comes to the song of verse 3, he's more than master. Lord of hosts, Yahweh, covenant God, with hosts of angels at His indeed command, but a different loading of the word Lord. What do you make of the seraphim covering their eyes and feet? Should we also be approaching the Lord in a different, humble posture? In a different, humble posture, I'm inclined to answer the question with yes, but different from what? And of course, and the thing is, how do we normally approach the Lord? <clears throat> A couple of things on that one. There is a… There used to be the habit of, of, um, of families doing an evening worship on their knees. I once visited a family in Holland, um, and just before bedtime, um, the um, father in the house um, led in devotions, and the whole family gets off their chairs and turns around and gets on their knees and bows before the throne of God. Okay, is that? But something of that humility, I was raised to uh, go on your knees beside your bed when you pray, right? But again, there's that sense of humility. Now, whether it requires that physical prostration or some metaphorical equivalent thereof, we can discuss that. And, but I do think that um, we have lost that sense of humility in the presence of God. And that's a very general statement. Um, and what's the evidence I would point to is not necessarily do we get on our knees, but I do think there's something about the kind of language we use. Um, a sense of awe. We're in the presence of Him who is so different, so other, He's too much. But the language, if I may dare say it, 
among so many of us has become quite colloquial. And we talk to God not all that different from how we talk to our buddy. And I know there's that's one ditch being too colloquial, and the other ditch is, yeah, a super pious kind of talk. And that's not right either. But I think we have, yeah, veered too far into the colloquial and lost a sense of his otherness. And I would plead that we restore a, 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 a healthy understanding of who God is that comes out in how we speak to Him. Another little example of that is, um, it, 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 it puzzles me, um, or puzzles, and it bothers me too. You listen to people praying, and they finish the prayer, and they use the word amen, and there's not even room for a period, and you're into the next sentence, or back to work. I mean, on, on to the business at hand. And that whole idea of stepping out of God's presence and getting back into what we're doing now. And, 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 no, you've been in God's presence. That has got to... That has an impact on you. And again, so, so yeah, this is something we can learn here from, uh, from uh, the seraphim posture. Yes, there is. Absolutely. Today we hear the word holy used often as an exclamation. Thoughts on this? How do we approach this? Yeah. As an exclamation, eh? Holy cow. And I think, no. That word describes my God and not my cow. And use that as, a, as an expression of uh, frustration or amazement or whatever the case might be. And again, how to approach it? Well, just describe it for what it is. That's who God is. Uh, no, I shall not use words like that in profane ways. That's all I have. Okay, we are running out of time now, so I want to thank Reverend Bowen for uh, presenting this topic, a very significant one and also for those who gave questions. Our final closing hymn is going to be hymn number five. There are four stanzas in hymn number five. And Reverend Bauman will close with prayer.
Let's go to this God in prayer. Lord God, holy, holy you are, so other, so much more than anything created, beyond our understanding, incomprehensible God. And yet you are pleased to relate to us, people. Reveal yourself. Connect. In Jesus Christ, make us your children. In your spirit, dwell within us. It's also mind Boggling, Lord, who are we? Dust to be temples of the Holy One. Who are we? Creatures, sinners. Privilege to image you, reflect what you were like in some little way. You make us so rich to be made your people, heirs of God. You would dwell on this earth with us forever. It's all so wonderful. And we confess, Lord, that it's so tempting for us to develop a creaturely concept in our heads of who you are, and then assume that you have to satisfy our criteria, our understanding, and to our shame, we acknowledge that we dare to criticize you, the God we've brought down to our level. Lord, we repent of that and pray that you forgive our sins and grant us your grace to adore you for who you are, ever to stand in awe that this God, so other, so unique, is our Father, and we, your children. And Lord, as we carry on with our lives in this world of yours and speak within our families and congregations and community about who you are. We pray for grace to give an accurate presentation of your divinity. This world so confused, also about who you are. Use us, Lord, for the benefit of many. Make many to stand in awe of you, 